Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, uh, lovely to welcome you to this Compassion and Politics webinar uh, on the psychology of conflict, which is looking specifically at um, the Ukraine war that, uh, that's happening right now. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Debbie Abrahams. I'm the Member of Parliament for Oldham East and Saddleworth, but I'm also the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group uh, for Compassionate Politics. Now, that's not some woolly group that, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that is looking up very little, but what we try and do is uh, our, our group's aim is to shift the culture of, in politics. So what we want to see is a political system um, that's less divisive, that, that's less antagonistic, and develop one that's a bit more cooperative, and more respectful in an attempt to address the political power inequalities that exist. We want to ensure um, that we have a system um, where, that where possible, we, we can work more in collaboration with each other. Um, but uh, we recognize we're not always going to agree uh, with everything. And, and we believe that in those circumstances, we need to agree to have uh, uh, courtesy and respect uh, when we disagree on those issues. And that is today's session. Um, uh, what we want to try and do um, is, is in that vein. So Putin's invasion of Ukraine has horrified the word world. I don't believe this is uh, what the Russian people want. I think we need to be very clear um, that, that it is our leaders that are making these decisions. They're not This isn't being driven by a Russian people. Thousands are known to have died in an assault which has been ferocious, indiscriminate and unpredictable. The invasion has posed existential questions to Western democracy, to democracies who have come to depend too greatly on Russian energy and we know that this is going to have an impact on our, our economies as, as well. In addition, we're seeing how the wealth of Russian oligarchs linked to Putin is interwoven into the fabric of our society, our political system, our financial services, and the so-called enablers, the law firms and others who seek to close down any question, questioning of these very wealthy people's activities. But the challenge for us today is to examine how our leaders' behavior and language can either help or hinder the de-escalation of this crisis, which threatens not just Ukrainians, but also global peace. So what do we know about Putin's personality and leaders like him? What conditions allow leaders like him to ascend to power? What do we need to be aware of if we're going to successfully manage someone like him? So if we look at his, uh, you know, the, in contrast, um, uh, Putin's personality and leadership style with that of President Zelensky, what do the actions of President Zelensky and those who have opened their arms to Ukrainian refugees teach us about alternative approaches of leadership, compassion and human nature? And, and should we also be reflecting on how our approach has also responded um, in this, this particular refugee crisis has been very different to the experience um, of other refugee crises. Millions of refugees are now looking to the West for support, exposing nations' willingness or lack of to help those beyond their borders. What, the, what does the UK's response need to consider? What do the UK and other democratic leaders need to do to de-escalate this conflict and create lasting peace? That is the million dollar question, as they say. And I'm actually delighted to say it's not going to be down to me to, <laughs> to come up with solutions about this. But instead, we I'm really, really grateful to be joined today by Professor Paul Gilbert, who's a clinical psychology, uh, psychologist and founder of the Compassionate Mind Foundation at the University of Derby. And Dr. Claire York, who's the fellow at the Centre of War Studies at the University of South, Southern Denmark and a researcher in emotions and, and politics. So welcome to both of you. Uh, and I know Paul and Claire, you're go, both going to speak to for about uh, eight minutes, um, and then I'll put a, a few questions to you and then we'll open it up to the floor. And I think Paul, you've, uh, you said you're gonna go first. Um, so I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Terry. And thank you very much for inviting me to this very important uh, meeting. So compassion, <clears throat> the first thing I think is to be clear about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, we know that compassion has an evolutionary history. Uh, it's rooted in the brain. And when we activate compassion, we stimulate particular brain areas. We also know that it's very easy to turn it off. So compassion is basically a sensitivity to suffering 
with a preparedness and a commitment to do something about it. So you've got two aspects to it, which is sensitivity, that's the first thing. And then the second is the wise way of taking action. So at the root of compassion is courage and wisdom. It's sometimes confused with things like love and kindness, they're great, but the center of compassion is courage and wisdom. So we need courage and wisdom. What is the courage and wisdom for dealing with this crisis? The first thing is to recognize that politics is one of the most difficult of professions because you're having to deal with the human brain is out of context. Most uh, ways in which animals deal with conflict is through violence. Dominant hierarchies in most primates is through violence. We even know that chimpanzees and other groups go to war. Humans, or the path towards humanity, came in when we had hunter-gatherer societies. And hunter-gatherer societies actually were the area where we developed our compassionate capacities, where we changed the nature of our brain, actually. But what we did that by actually getting rid of dominant males. When dominant males, aggressive males, try to assert authority or aggression, the subordinates ganged up against them. And it was the process by which subordinates ganged up against dominant males to keep them out of influence that led to the development of hunter-gatherer societies. And in hunter-gatherer societies, we developed what is called a care and share way of being. Caring and sharing was the answer to our uh, evolutionary challenges, and it made us the kind of species we are. Unfortunately, agriculture came along it changed the dynamic of that relationship. Wealth began to uh, mount and we reverted back to dominant male hierarchies. The challenge is now, if you look back at history, we have been absolutely hounded by dominant male hierarchies. Whether you look at the Vikings, the Egyptians, the Romans, you, wherever you look, the last 5,000 years have been an absolute uh, horror show in terms of what we've done to other human beings in terms of our wars, our violence, our slavery, our tortures. You think of the Roman games, you think of crucifixions. We have basically, for thousands of years, been living in terror states. In a way, Putin is a throwback. He is a, a classic, a leader that arises when there is a lot of wealth and power around and the subordinates are unable to prevent that from happening. Democracies offer some kind of constraint on these kind of personalities getting into power. So that's the first thing then to realize that humans are potentially one of the nastiest, cruelest, vicious species that have ever lived on this planet. You know, compassion is not naive. You know, compassion has to be for the dark side. We have a terrible dark side. Not so long ago, we had the Holocaust in Germany. But Germany also taught us some lessons about how do we deal with societies that have been very violent. And that was, of course, with the Marshall Plan. So we're having to also think about what are we going to do post-Putin? Because my personal view is Putin's finished. This war has never been as documented as... Uh, anytime. And we know that people have got it on their mobile phones. We know that gradually uh, information is seeping back to the Russian people. And Debbie, you made a brilliant point. We have to drive a wedge between the Russian people and the leader. You, that wedge is absolutely essential. So the way we talk about Russia or the Russians should be quite separate from how we talk about Putin. Very, very important. We drive that wedge. So I think, for example, we should really be talking about the, the wonders of Russia, the music of Russia, the science of Russia, the literature of Russia, and so that they are hearing these messages. That we think they, they are a great people. It's the people who are great. The leader is not. But unfortunately, there's nothing unusual about Putin. We've all had leaders like this in our history, if you go back far enough. So that's, that's really quite important. And I was a bit disappointed to hear that, you know, some of the orchestras have stopped playing Tchaikovsky. We should celebrate people like Tchaikovsky. That is, that is the wonder of, of that. So the second thing really is um, we need to be very careful about how we talk about Putin behind his back, as it were. Uh, when uh, you know, we have a compassion in the prisons, right? And one of my colleagues said, look, imagine you've been taken hostage um, with somebody's put a gun to your head. Would you like a police officer outside of you taking, telling this guy that he's a madman and crazy, or would you like somebody who can talk him down? We need to talk this guy down because this he is potentially very dangerous and keeps saying that he's a madman and he's gonna be done for war crimes and everything like this. This is just inflaming what is already a fragile personality. So I think what Zelensky is doing is trying to talk this guy down, talk him down, talk him down. So if you, if you work in any way, where you have potent people who are potentially dangerous, the thing to do is don't stir them up, talk them down. Once the conflict is over, then we can think about, you know, 
how you want to see that, whether you want to have investigations or whatever. But at the moment, the most important thing, try and settle these, these individuals down as best you can. The second thing is I think we need to be planning now for post-Putin. You know, are we going to have a kind of a Marshall Plan for Russia and Ukraine? The problem that we've got is that this, and I'll finish on this, that this war has seeded intense hatred. This has seeded intense hatreds. And how we deal with those hatreds is going to be very, very important post-Putin. We've got some um, uh, things to go on, like the uh, truth and reconciliation in South Africa and so forth. We have some models that we can work, but we've got to start thinking about how we can heal this these terrible wounds this man has inflicted on these two populations, these two groups, was, as you said, Debbie, the Russian people don't want this. I mean, I have got colleagues in Russia who are psychotherapists and they are, you know, they're just in tears. They're absolutely devastated because they don't quite know how to help their, their patients. They don't know what's going on. And we also have to address the issue that we do recognize that the Russian people have been held in a regime of fear. Uh, and therefore they are very frightened. We have to speak also to those who have a lot of courage. I thought Arne, Arne Schwarzenegger's message to the Russian people was terrific, right? We need to understand that. We need to speak to the people, drive a wedge between the people and the leader. Calm, try and calm this leader down. Don't keep inflaming him, okay? Let's have less chest thumping here. Let's have less machoism here. Let's have less, oh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna bomb you, we need to be stronger. I mean, let's just keep that in the background. Of course, we need to do that, but let's just try and find a way just to settle this man's mind as best we can. Brilliant, Paul, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Um, and now I'm gonna hand over to Kate, uh, to Claire, beg your pardon, Claire. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to join you and thank you to everyone joining from around the world. I've been seeing your countries pop up in the chat, so thank you so much. And to Paul as well, who's opened a number of really fascinating topics that I hope we can return to. Um, I think empathy and war raises some really interesting questions about the direction of our empathy. Um, and in my comments, I'm not going to touch on whether or not we should empathize with Putin and what that means, but that's maybe something we might want to get into in the questions. In the first instance, I think from our standpoint, our care and support should be directed to the Ukrainian people, to the Russians who protested and made a stand, and to all those who are helping on the front line, who are risking their lives as well, and all those who are supporting from afar. It's been such a heartbreaking and harrowing few weeks. And there's a lot of direct and vicarious trauma and insecurity right now, um, both for those in Ukraine and Russia and those in diaspora and those who are watching from afar. I'm gonna focus on three core areas um, and I'm gonna focus primarily on empathy and compassion in action in leadership, especially leadership in a crisis. I'm then gonna talk about um, empathy and compassion in citizen action and the outpouring of support we've seen for refugees. And then I also want to look at what this means for the future and how this offers an opportunity to really rethink how we conduct diplomacy in international relations. Um, and so I think firstly, President Zelensky has just been such a phenomenal example of strong and authentic and effective leadership. His decision to stay has been a significant factor in the way this war has unfolded. And he's really managed to unite the people, showing bravery and courage and strength and a commitment to a free Ukraine. And I think it's been so striking how he's been putting people first. This is not a man who's a, a general. This is someone who is an actor, a comedian, but who's really um, taken the decision to lead his country, to be there on the ground. And it's so striking to see his natural ability to connect, how he's there in a crisis for the people. He's sat alongside the troops eating with them. He's going into hospitals to help those who've been wounded. He's making it very clear that he is right there alongside them. And it's interesting to see how he's using social media to really make this a mass kind of movement that his message is reaching far and wide, um, all corners, um, of the earth, you know, he's reaching out to Hollywood as well as political leaders. He's really mobilizing the message and using that kind of emotional connection um, and a very kind of um, authentic and clear way of communicating, not only the challenge that he faces and the threat that they face and what they have to do, but also his own vulnerability, which is I think what makes him resonate so much. He, he is very clear about his concerns for his people, for his own fear of death 
for his exhaustion. Um, he still retains that humor and that kind of ability to demonstrate both resolve um, and determination with the necessary attributes and the empathy that builds trust, which is essential to really create, create morale within the population to aid resilience. So people know he's gonna be there through this. Um, it's a really positive example of leadership that's very, very inspiring to people around the world. But what's also really fascinating is he's not just directing this to the Ukrainian people. Like Paul also said, he's doing a lot of speeches to the Russian people in Russian. And he knows that they're not going to see this right now. But what's interesting is he's reflecting on their shared history, their common humanity, and the hope that maybe they might get through um, via telegram or some of these other um, mediums. But he's also doing it for the records, for the history books. Um, he knows that this is important for the process of aiding reconciliation. You have to be showing dignity and respect to the adversary, especially because the Russian people are distinct to the Russian state. Um, but at the same time, it's really important. And this is where um, often we think about empathy as a weakness, but it has to be matched by strength. He's very explicit on the red lines. If you come and invade us, if you attack us, you will die. But if you surrender, then we will treat you with dignity and respect. And it's really notable that they are treating Russian um, prisoners of war with dignity and respect, um, especially now they've stopped showing them on social media. And this kind of moral high ground might be easily dismissed. But again, it speaks to that integrity and a commitment to the values you're fighting for, which make it very effective, both politically and strategically, and in terms of the longer term, whatever happens, but it also helps to weaken the morale of the other side who are outmaneuvered, insufficiently repaired, prepared, and also shocked that they haven't been met with this kind of hero's welcome that they were expecting. So it's very powerful. Um, I think had he fled, we'd be dealing with a very diff different situation right now. Um, and so I think he deserves a huge amount of praise and credit. The second point is about refugees um, and it's been incredibly powerful to watch citizens and communities come together to demonstrate the common humanity. We've seen this real outpouring of generosity with people meeting Ukrainian refugees at train stations, with food, with drinks, with offers of shelter, with buggies for children. Um, and I think this outpouring of support has often been ahead of governments themselves. And I think governments have a lot to learn about the capacity of societies for compassion, about the capacity for people to have generosity. Um, and it's also important because a lot of governments right now are not really delivering on the force that Ukraine would want. And so therefore showing support for the people itself is another way of demonstrating that the countries, especially in Europe, are there for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. But I do also think, and this is where we get into some of the politics of compassion, um, what this has also revealed is the double standard. And I think there's going to be a challenge for governments in the longer term about why Afghan and Syrian refugees were not accorded the same treatment. Um, and I think that's going to erode trust in the kind of standards and the human ideals that we promote. And I think it's going to really make people question why they aren't afforded and accorded the same level of um, care. And this is something that really has to be addressed if we believe that human rights and humanity and dignity is, is really critical. Um, another problem with the politics of compassion, as we've seen in previous crises, both in the refugee crisis in 2015 and also with the pandemic, there is a point of compassion fatigue and burnout. And there's only so long that people are able to care at a high intensity. And so at the moment, we see that people are very, very generous and willing to support those who are fleeing from the conflict. But there's a danger that if governments don't manage this properly and don't um, provide the necessary support for people and for the people coming into their countries, that you will then get a backlash if you're not careful. And that's something we really need to avoid because um, this is gonna be a uh, um, long-standing crisis um, and the fallout from the war is gonna be a long time. Um, Finally, um, and to finish in the longer term, as, as you both already said, we need to separate the leadership from the people of Russia and speak to the people in Russia with the respect. And I think Paul's idea of reflecting on the history and what is what wealth the his history of Russia has provided is very important. Um, and I think the speech by Arnold Schwarzenegger was such a fascinating example of the balance of um, 
emotion and reason and force and historical connection. Um, I think maybe in the questions we can come to ideas of negotiations and dialogue, but I really think that what this reveals is that we have to reevaluate evaluate our stories. So many of our stories have been very Western centric, very American and British centric. And if we want to look bigger and we want to address the challenges that we face in the 21st century, we really need to see us working towards a greater system of integrity and equity in the international system. We need to see more, more humility from the greater, from the bigger powers. We need to see smaller powers um, afforded much more voice and dialogue within the system. We need to listen to their concerns and their challenges that they face. And we need to start to create a system that has more equitable dialogue. Um, and with that, bring in that sense of empathy and listening and compassion. Um, there was a great quote today by Jan Egland, who's the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council. And he said that this crisis will force us to unlock the deadlock of indifference. And I think that's something we really need to think about. How do we start to show care going forward and really revitalize the international system and how we treat others? Because Ukraine is um, awful, but we're also looking at tragedies in Yemen, in Syria, possible escalation in Libya. And we need to start thinking about that far more coherently. That was fantastic, Claire. Th thank you so much. Uh, really um, got me thinking. So I'm sure everybody watching is, is, is the same. If you could hold on to your questions, um, but do put them in the chat. Um, there'll be a chance um, for us to uh, take uh, some uh, that are posted um, in the next uh, few minutes. I'm, I'm going to kick off if I, if I may. Um, I think what you said is what you both said is incredibly interesting, and and I was particularly uh, interested in what Paul was saying uh, around the um, the changes that we've seen, the um, the evolutionary changes that we are we have compassion inbuilt, but you know by various changes throughout society in terms of how we live, we've reverted back to this. Um, you know, very dominant male model, the hierarchical model um, across uh, across the world. I was just wondering, in terms of we have seen incredibly authoritarian leaders in democracies as as as, as well, um, but I wondered in terms of why or what what were the conditions that you have identified that have allowed them. To, to take power and, and what are their sort of tactics in gaining that power? Yes, it's a wonderful question, Debbie. So the first thing is that there are these two basic strategies of resource control. One is called control and hold, which is what most primates do. And then you just accumulate what you can. And the other one is care and share. Well, basically a care and share species actually, but we've been forced into control and hold and we do it viciously when we do it. How do they get there? They get there partly because we're also a very submissive species. We forget this. And it's our submissiveness that has got us into serious trouble. I mean, if you think about it, how can you get young males to charge at each other with spears and swords in hands, watching each other be hacked to death year after year, century after century? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So we have to understand how is it that we are so compliant in the violence to maintain these aggressive males. That's, that's I, you know, in my life, I've studied submissive behavior, very interesting submissive behavior. There's a wonderful book called The Crime, Crimes of Obedience. So that's a really key issue that we do, they manage to pull around them a group of males that support them, and then they create terror in the population below. We see this time and again, we mm. do that, and we've certainly done that in Russia. So that's what happens. They get into power, and then they create these groups of other males a little bit like them and then they suppress everybody else so the question is then how can you empower subordinates now democracies is partly a way of doing that mm -hmm. but you'll also have these individuals who will try and subvert that through the media by getting control of the narrative and trying to stimulate conflict we have some aspects of the media who like to stimulate conflict because then they can sell the blood on the carpet now can't they mm -hmm. rather than actually stimulate compassionate solutions so 
I think we need to keep thinking very carefully about how our media works. We need to think very carefully about how we empower people. We need people to become much more politically engaged. I mean, mm. the kind of work that you're doing, Debbie, is terrific because it gives people hope that actually uh, politics is something that's worth getting involved mm. in. You, we can have a compassionate politics, isn't it? It's wonderful. So I think there are a whole load of things that we can do to facilitate um, compassionate policies, but we have to understand what we're up against. We have a terrible dark side in humanity that's partly driven by these dominant groups getting power, but then they make the rest of us all kind of comply to their wishes. Again, very, very interesting, Paul. I, I wanted, um, fr from your point of view, Claire, you mentioned about the, the, the importance of equity at an international level, and, and obviously also within country, um, I, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree. What, what part do you think that has played um, in terms of contributing to the conditions that un enable these, the, the inequality that is, that contribute to um, the, the conditions that, that enable these um, authoritarian leaders within, as I say, within democracies as, as well, to, to enable them to, to thrive? Um, do, you, do you think that that just, you know, that, creates um, resentment, it creates um, fear, um, and then that's exploited by, by these, these leaders, these so-called strong men? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, I mean, I think it's quite complex. There's multiple factors at play, but I think when you have this very unequal imbalance within society, you leave a lot of people feeling marginalized. You leave a, a lot of people with, insecurity where you don't know where you're um that you can afford your rent that you can afford your food that you can afford to put your family through school or can yeah. a job and i think this creates a kind of sense of precarity mm. that uh, powerful figures can exploit and they can explain it and it's ironic because people like putin are billionaires mm. you know they have a huge amount of money in the elite um in russia but we see this in other countries as well this disparity in wealth um, and then how that breeds kind of resentments, but also it means that people want answers. And they also, I think, particularly when we look, for example, at the refugee crisis in the past, mm -hmm. that would be what was exploited, that people would feel that people were coming to take jobs, which was not really the true story, but that offers an explanation rather than looking at the ways in which systems and structures within society are failing people. And yeah. so they have to have a much more holistic approach. Um, and also look at the kind of messages and the media and the stories that we're telling around this and what's being done. You know, I think the very fact that you've got a small group of people who've become far wealthier over the pandemic, while a lot of people have become a lot poorer, have lost a lot and have suffered a great deal of trauma um, at the same time is going to cause long term problems if that's not addressed. Well, thank you both. I'm going to ask one final one. I mean, we haven't really talked about social media and I do want to, you know, in the role that social media uh, and disinformation um, uh, is being used um, by, uh, you, we mentioned Zelensky in a positive sense and we must, you know, all, always try to look for the positives as well. And he's used it to communicate, uh, but we must also um, recognise that uh, social media is, we, we know this from various um, uh, hearings and inquiries um, is also being used to spread disinformation, propaganda, um, and, uh, and and the like. So, uh, would would like at some stage to to have that uh, discussed this, this afternoon. But I wondered if you were the international leaders now that that you are a member of NATO and you want to send a message to Putin. What would you be saying within that NATO group in terms of how? Um, we should be behaving. Paul, do you want to have a go first? Then I'll ask Claire yeah. if she can. Well, firstly, <laughs> we would try to ascertain what his mental state is, because we're hearing all kinds of things about maybe he's become very paranoid, maybe he's Asperger, maybe he's a narcissist, maybe he's a... So it's very, very difficult to know um, how what the best maneuvers would be until we have some understanding about what kind of person we're dealing with. We've got a little bit of understanding. And I think, you know, um, Christina is absolutely right. We do need a bit of empathy. Empathy is about the ability to understand the mind of the other. So yes. that's the first thing. The second thing is I would try as best I can 
to kind of slightly calm him down a little bit um, rather than G him up and start thumping my chest and we're going to do this to you, we're going to do that to you. Mm. Try and find out if there is any maneuver, if he's interested in a way out because people say, let's give him a way out, but he may not be interested in a way out. Mm. You know that some of these individuals um, would rather die in the process than actually find a way out. They're not interested in a way out. And he's mm. one of these individuals who has a very interesting view of Russian history. Apparently when the French Prime Minister went to see him, he was given a five hour lecture on Russian history. So we know that this person is absolutely wedded to his idea of being a savior. That is the Hitler complex all over again, isn't it really? So again, you have to start thinking about, oh, say, so how can we kind of work with that in order to kind of pull his psychology away from violence into something more useful, more positive. So those are very difficult maneuvers. You have the same kind of problem if you have difficulties in prisons as well. How can you get people away from their desires to commit violence and mayhem and try and calm them down a little bit? But I, I think it's very, very difficult because we're in, in a situation now where there is almost no turning back um, for him. Uh, and I think he, at some level, will know that he's finished because, as I say, sooner or later, the truth will filter through to Russia. I mean, there's so many mobile phones taking so many pictures. There's so much going on in the background now that um, sooner or later, I suspect, I might be wrong about this, I suspect that there will be a turning against him. My interest is, is in the people that support him. Mm. It is actually talking to the ones just below him and seeing mm. if they want a way out and then talking to them about a possible armistice. Once they stop supporting him, he's finished. So whether or not you have to deal directly with him or whether you actually have to get to the people who might be worried about him failing because of what's going to happen to them, those are the individuals I would start to try to make alliances with. So because if they turn against him, that is the end of the game. Yeah. So, so that's that's the message to uh, anybody then that's in NATO that is trying to uh, to work on this. Work for the people below and uh, see if we can actually uh, get uh, get this, this this sorted. Right. I'm going to. Um, and I don't know, um, Claire, if you want to have a go on that one as well. Yeah, and I think I mean, it's a whole strategy meeting in that question. It's such <laughs> it prompts so many thoughts. Um, I, I always think in international relations, and I, I love studying emotions in international relations, I don't think we look enough at the logics of shame and humiliation. And I think the more that you shame and humiliate someone who values prestige and who sees themselves as historically a great power, a representative of a historically mm -hmm. great power, you push them further away from a negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And I think that's counterintuitive to those of us who are angry and um, very much dislike seeing violence, mm -hmm. very much dislike this mode of governments and dislike the man himself, but it's still important that you are able to engage in a dialogue where you can treat people with respect. I, um, I studied um, Nixon's a visit to China in 1972 and what was striking was how much they built into their communications with the Chinese affording them respect and dignity and talking about the history of China really reflecting back to them how they saw themselves that they were this great civilization and so I think finding a narrative where you both are able to say we see you mm -hmm. we see how you see the situation but these are also our red lines this is also not acceptable this is how we view the story from our point of view and this is where um, we have to be very careful about how this might escalate so you have to match that kind of clear communication with very firm kind of boundaries and a sense of um showing what what is possible where there might be off ramps but also where it's really not tolerable that things continue and i think it's a very, very delicate dance right now because of the stakes involved. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very important that I think the, the narrative and the communications does de-escalate this and does kind of avoid, I'm very cautious of um, depicting him as a madman because I think that prevents you from really seeing what's going on under the surface because you then um, dismiss it as irrational, as something you can't understand. You have to try and understand this. Yes. Even like it even if you condemn what's happening you have to understand it 
Very, very interesting. Thank you so much, both of you. Right, it's your turn now. Uh, and I'm just going to um, look at the questions that I have, have, uh, have, have been forwarded. Um, unfortunately, I've got one in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. I'm ever so sorry. Um, not uh, hola. Um, but I've got one from Hannah. Um, who says, how does Paul feel about freezing the assets of the oligarchs, given his comments about treating Russians separately to how we feel about Putin? Do you want to ask that, uh, answer that one, Paul? No, I think yeah. it's a fascinating new movement in the control of international threat is by freezing the assets of those who are in the dominant elites. Put, letting the dominant elites know that you cannot avoid the consequences of what your leaders are doing, I think, mm. really, really important. And I there was a thing in the report in the Guardian today that some of this money is massive. I mean, it's yes. millions. millions. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a hugely different way in which we've been dealing, which we're now dealing with international conflicts. And but the only slight problem with it is, of course, it takes time to bite. But and uh, people, some people have said that we haven't gone far enough actually. But absolutely, I think we should definitely um, uh, do that. It's it's absolutely the right thing to do. I don't know if you want to comment on that one, Claire. No, <laughs> I, I think it's a, an excellent point. It it, it really is. Um, the, uh, we've been discussing this quite a bit, both in the chamber and and outside, in terms of um, how how this money has has infiltrated at all levels as it, as i mentioned in my uh, opening remarks within our society so i think you know it will have significant implications but it it shows how corrupting it has it has been unfortunately right let me just have a quick look to see if i can find another one okay and this is from nuria do you think empathy can help leaders become become Coming numb towards horror as they work towards their goal. Um, yeah, my answer is no. Okay. What about you, Claire? Yeah, I also I'm not I'm not sure about the way in which it works. Them becoming numb. I mean, I think there's, it's such a complex domain, politics, um, and certainly there are certain elements that are numbed. Um, for them to become leader, and maybe it's that they see so much and they start to um, they start to ignore some of the core elements within society that matter to a vibrant society. Um, but I see the second part of the question is also about the general public and how we work on empathy. Um, and I think it's really about having the difficult conversations. It's reading different news sources. It's finding out what people we disagree with think and feel about the world and being able to have that understanding so that we can then translate that to one another. Yeah, one other point is empathy is a competency, right? It's an ability to understand and mind read other people, to have a sense of what they're feeling, what they're, why they're doing, what they're doing, what their values are. Um, but you can use empathy for good or bad. I mean, if you want to be a deceiver, if you're good at empathy, you're going to be good at deceiving and lying, right? Mm -hmm. What's important is the motivation. So motivation is very different from a competency. You know, why do you want to use empathy? How are you using empathy? What are you using empathy to do? That's the key issue. So um, the, the, when you're using empathy to be compassionate, to try to work out how to reduce violence, how to reduce suffering, then, then that doesn't, because that's your motivation that does not numb you. In fact, it makes you more sensitive. Very good, right, I'm just... Um... Uh, Debbie, uh, yes. Matt here, I was just gonna say, I've sent you some questions in the chat, which I'm also happy Thank to you. read out if that is at all helpful, but... Yeah. Let's carry on, Matt. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> well, there's basically been a few questions that are quite similar, um, which are, how, what does a compassionate approach to Putin look like um and as, and then on the same lines how do we do that without giving him the impression that his actions are in any way valid claire do you want to try that one is that yeah and i think i think that's a really <laughs> hard balancing act um it's it's about saying look we understand that these are your concerns 
but then being able to push back on them while at the same time enabling a dialogue. And I think part of the challenge is it's going to get much, much worse for Russia as the sanctions bite. Mm. I think there are going to be um, openings for expressing awareness of the pain that's going to come um, economically yeah. and socially um, and saying, are you sure this is where you want to go? Look at what's happening to the people. And it might be, you know, this idea of empathy being um, leaders being numb that he doesn't care, but it's very, I think it's a real way by which to say, look, there are ways out of this. And I agree with Paul. I think it's, I don't think he, is going to be in power all that long anymore because I get the feeling from the things I'm reading that there are movements afoot, but we don't know that. And actually, if you get rid of the leader, you've still got the systems and structures that enable them to get there in the first place. And mm -hmm. so you need to be showing, I don't actually think it's compassion. I think it's strategic empathy, it, which is much um, more kind of um, cognitive. It's not quite as caring in that sense but it's reflecting back to someone that you are conscious and aware and engaged in a process of trying to understand them while at the same time clearly communicating your point of view because this isn't about conceding it isn't about appeasement i think there's a danger that yeah. when we conflict we get into kind of chamberlain analogies that isn't what we should be talking about this is a different context um we have to be very careful about how we manage this and it's about that kind of strategic approach to empathy. We understand that this is what you're thinking. We understand that maybe you feel insecure and they've, you know, the, from some of the talks that have taken place, it seems that they want Ukraine to give up wanting to have a place in NATO and the EU. So that suggests that there is an element of this insecurity involved, um, but that's a decision for Ukraine to make. Um, and so how do you have this dialogue um, where you're able to reflect on that and really understand um, and also use intermediaries who can get closer, mm -hmm. who are respected in Russia, to kind of say, look, what is going on? How do we get this message through? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's an easy, I don't think it's an easy situation at all. And we need to see which leaders in NATO um, are trusted as much as they might be trusted by Russia right now. Who will be listened to? Um, and mm -hmm. how can they convey that message? Who maybe outside of, of Europe will be mm -hmm. listened to? Although I have to say in the NATO uh, point, uh, some some people are also saying that that was just a red herring, that was just an excuse for him. Um, so, it, it's, but the trust thing is, it's um, it's that's a, a, a very interesting point. Paul, do you want to come in here? Yeah, so there are two things really. Firstly, look, um, all of us are just being made by our genes. We're all, no living thing chose to be what it is. No elephant chose to be an elephant. We didn't choose to be humans. We didn't choose to be males or females. If I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby into a violent drug gang, this version of Borgo wouldn't exist. Okay, so Putin is just a creation, right? And there's been, you know, billions of these creations. He's another creation that's really uh, potentially very, very damaging. But he didn't at five years old decide, you know what? I could be a doctor, I could be a monk, but no, I think I'll be a tyrant. It, these people could sort of grow into this, really. And it's not really in their will or not in their will. So that's the first thing is to when we see them is to see here is another human being who has been created um, by the forces of nature and so on. And the second point, really, I think it, where compassion comes in is the Dalai Lama once was talking to one of his monks who had been tortured by the Chinese. And he was asked, were you ever frightened? And the monk said, yes, I was. I was frightened I would lose compassion for my torturers. We are compassionate when we refuse to respond to the dark side. We refuse to respond out of vengeance. We always respond out of courageous wisdom of what is the best thing to do to reduce suffering. Because when these things happen, you know, when we're faced by these personalities, they can stimulate such rage in us, such hatred in us, that we then can be acting out of that state of mind and not a state of mind, which is really seeing the wise way to try as best we can to navigate through this horrific, horrendous situation, which will just, as I say, will, will lead, has planted seeds of hatred everywhere. So compassion is trying as best we can. And, and, you, and as Claire was saying, I think Zelensky has really managed to do that. I mean, you, you really feel from him that he's trying as best he can to respond from a compassionate position of wisdom and courage not from a position of hatred and, and retaliation and, and, and revenge and vengeance. So I, I think we've got a lot of hope for, for Ukraine if we can, if he, 
if he can stay leader. Yes, in, in, indeed. Right. Um, so another one. It seems that uh, Putin views the West as weak and decadent. How do we show him that we're not so? That's from Mary. Oh, I mean, I think that's a whole process of explaining a future politics. I mean, I think um, Britain, America and other countries have been struggling in recent years, kind of financially with disinformation and the pandemics also um, had a detrimental impact on people. And I think really it's about saying we're committed to reviving a different kind of politics that addresses the challenges societies face that, you know, um, and I think showing that people are invested, that we have a vibrant democracy, that citizens are a part of making the change. And we've seen that throughout the pandemic over the last few years, how much citizens have come together. The World Happiness Report was just out and it showed that people are getting kinder during the, during the pandemic and that helps resilience. But I think we also have to be committed to really addressing the inequalities and the problems within our own societies. Um, because I think that has been something that has enabled disinformation to thrive a little bit um, because it has um, weakened resilience, it has created distrust. I think the trust in government right now in Britain is very low. And that's something that politicians and governments have to really actively work to rebalance and redress. It has to work to re-earn the trust of citizens again. And I think you can't show Putin that in a in one very eloquent speech, that's a commitment over time that has to be made where measures have to be introduced. Yes, and yeah. the, the other thing is I point blank refuse to accept your definition of weakness. I do not accept it. I do not accept your definition of decadence. You can define it any way you want. That's not how I define it. There is something that's called moral courage. Courage isn't just out of the end of a gun, right? Being prepared to shoot somebody. That That is not what we mean by moral courage. Moral courage is the understanding about what it is that brings compassion into the world, what it is that allows you to stand by your values, what it is that allows the Ukrainians to defend their country in the way that they're defending their country. So we have to be very careful because otherwise there's a knee jerk. Oh no, we're not weak, we're shy, we're strong. I've got a gun that's bigger than yours, right? Be careful of that because you're buying into their whole way of thinking. They've caught you. I do not buy that. You know, I think that actually in many ways, what Ukraine has done has showed extraordinary courage, extraordinary courage. You cannot call what's going on in Ukraine weak. You cannot call that leader weak. He's, he's a fantastic source of courage and wisdom. No, I, I, think, I think that was from, from what my interpretation of Mary's question was about as a, as a whole, the West is. Um, um, and yeah, but anyway, we'll, we'll move on. Um, we got any more, Mac? Have you been able to? Like, the yeah, we've people. we've got quite a good number. So um, you read I'll, one I'll out. Just go yeah. through. Yeah. So I mean, there's a question that refers back to Paul's comment about the media and um, about why they enjoy conflict so much and what, if anything, can be done about that. Yeah, good point. Very good point. And if you could you um, add your your views around social media as well. I mean, that would be and how that can be quite polarizing as, 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 as well, if you're able to do that. Who, if, who wants to start? Paul, do you want to, to start off with that one? Social media. Yeah, social media, again, all of these things are very new in terms of the history of humanity. <laughs> they really, I mean, I suppose at one point we had drums we used to signal to each other. But um, <clears throat> so we're all learning, that, feeling our way here. I mean, I think we forget just how new this all is. I mean, you know, we're just talking with my, my son uh, a few a few days ago saying he can remember at school there's no such thing as mobile phones, you know. It's extraordinary. So we're feeling our way here. So we, we need to work out how social media can be used for the good, but it can also, like everything, we have a dark side to it too. In terms of the other forms of the media, I think having a free press is very, very important, but also we need a responsible press. And we have to acknowledge that sometimes our press are not particularly responsible. They're very voyeuristic. 
they like to kind of sell all the stories of pain and suffering and you know people are sort of being blown up and you have a microphone can you tell me what was it like to be blown up can you tell me how you feel i mean that's just voyeuristic awfulness isn't it really so we we need a media who's able to think about what is it that we want to create in society? What is it we want people to, how do we want people to behave? Do we want them to behave compassionately and supportively to each other? Because if we want that, what are the stories we're going to tell and how are we going to tell those stories? Or do we want people to be in conflict all the time? And as you've pointed out, Debbie, you know, our politics have rather descended into, you know, who is the worst, you know, <laughs> just try to make each other look bad. So we've, we've got to pull back from that really and try to find out how we have a media that can also present the good, what's, what's good in the world. And, you know, many newscasters and have been on this um, position as well, being concerned about the, the stories that we tell. But the stories that we tell are about ourselves as a species, as a group, as a nation, are very, very important. And I think sometimes we don't always tell stories that are conducive to compassion really. Okay, Claire, go on. I think to add to that, one of the, I mean, social media is amazing for the reach and the dissemination that you can get. The fact that we are able to follow what's going on in Ukraine and be kind of in that world in real time, we can see things as they emerge is very powerful, but it also has a danger of being too reductionist that we end up seeing the world through 240 characters. And we need to, I think, recognize that international relations and politics is complex. It's about compromise and challenge. It's about difficult, um, very tightly knotted problems that take a long time to unpick. And we have to be able to have far more long form content where we can get into the challenges that face politicians, that face us as citizens, that face us as societies without reducing it to very binary Hollywood style scripts of good versus evil. Um, and it's interesting when I was looking through archives from the 1920s, 1930s, you have very detailed foreign policy accounts and they still will, there's still propaganda in a way, there's still a sense of a government's message to the people, but very detailed explanations of this is why we have this policy and this is what it means. This is how we've come to this decision. Then if you want to have a vibrant democracy and you want to have a healthy debate, you have to make space both for different points of view, but also for more complex understandings of the challenges that we face. And that's something that we don't always see in a media environment that is led by what sells, what gets likes and clicks, and what conveys itself easily on social media. So we have to be looking at that. Yes, the sort of, uh, how many characters is it now? 140, whatever, it, how many characters it is <laughs> to sort of put your political <laughs> message to the different aspects of it. Goodness, that would, that would uh, be a challenge indeed. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's one here which is very specific on on uh, what Paul was mentioning uh, around the um, Putin's um, personality type. So somebody is, uh, I think it's um, from West Linton Village Centre. Is Putin a sociopath? What evidence is there that he has the capacity to empathise with others, um, the capacity to negotiate, or the capacity to be trusted? It's Ian at the West Linton Village Centre. I think we just don't know. We okay. just do not know. I mean, there are many potential um, <clears throat> diagnoses, if you want to use that term, you can offer. Uh, I've seen all kinds of one. And until you actually talk to people and, to, and see what's driving them, it's very difficult to know. I mean, some people just have this mesmeranic kind of uh, messianic vision that they are the saviors and they're going to you know uh, and it's all in the common good and we, i don't actually know if he actually believes his own rhetoric if he does then that takes him more into a sort of paranoid kind of position but i just don't know i i really don't know similarly i don't know i think it's really hard to kind of diagnose someone from afar when you have no not it's certain i think that he's um, probably become accustomed to power and the trappings that that brings, the kind of isolation you get from the everyday lives of people. And that I think is a hindrance to making decisions based on what the people want. Um, as for being a sociopath, I, I don't know. I think he's certainly, it's yeah, he's certainly a very um, dangerous leader right now. 
Um, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna kind of clinically diagnose anybody. <laughs> but I think the, the, the problem is, is you have three, the three C's, compassion, callousness, and cruelty, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> the problem is when you have these kind of driven people, however, whatever's driving them, they become callous. They become indifferent to the suffering they cause. So compassion is the sensitivity to suffering. Callousness is insensitivity to suffering. We see this in business people as and well, you know, all, all kinds of areas where people do things out of self-interest and really don't care at all about the consequences of what they're doing. So certainly there's an element of callousness to this man. And that would that aspect, therefore, means that he is probably not going to be very susceptible to awareness of the suffering he's caused because whether he's dissociating or whatever is happening, he's clearly not uh, paying attention, put it that way, to the immense suffering he's causing. Because if he was, I think, if he was sensitive to the suffering he was causing, uh, that would put a stop to it, but he's clearly not. So from my point of view, that would be the biggest issue. Whatever the diagnosis, he has become callous, he's become switched off from suffering, and that is, that's a serious worry. Okay, we've just got a few minutes left now. I just wondered if, uh, Claire, you mentioned in terms of the, um, the double standards in relation to how we, and it's not just the UK, but other countries as well have, have responded to the refugee crisis. Um, if we think about um, the response to Ukraine, Ukrainian uh, refugees as opposed to um, uh, for, ex for example, last summer, um, the Afghanistan um, crisis as, as, as well. In fact, I asked um, the minister in the house just that question. When, when were there going to be homes for Af Afghanistan? Because there's still tens of thousands of, of people who are living in hiding um, because of their activism. Um, uh, and uh, are now under threat from the Taliban. So, what, what do you think? What does that say about us as a as a, a, a country? Oh, I mean, I think I think in some ways this is one of the challenges we have with empathy is that we often empathise um, with those who are nearest to us, and maybe as a country we identify with the threat from Russia more than maybe threats that other countries are facing. We feel that sense of vicarious threat. And that means that we want to help because we know how close it is to us. What I'm curious about is whether now that we have experienced a far more visceral reaction to a conflict and we've seen the damage that it wreaks on our doorstep, whether actually maybe we will recognize that this experience is what so many others are going through having to leave your home, you don't do it unless you really have to. Um, and maybe it will force us to say, well, we need to rethink that actually pushing dinghies back in the channel is very inhumane. And maybe you can't take in everybody, but do you have to treat them like criminals? I'd say no, I think we have to look at treating people with far more dignity, at recognizing that that is a very treacherous journey to be taking and use this experience as a way to say, now we have a much more intimate knowledge of the, of the damage of conflict, of the trauma and the pain and the long legacy that it leaves. And that then compels new decisions for us to take. Because I do think there's a danger that you will lose trust of other countries and other people. It's interesting to look on Twitter and Instagram and it, on news media from people in countries um, from Syria, from people who are Palestinian, Syrian, Libyan, saying we didn't get this treatment. Um, what does this say? And if we continue to promote the same values of dignity and human rights and freedom, then we have to start really looking at where our actions are not aligning with that and what we can do to make a difference while also accepting the very difficult challenges domestically as well with the economy, with jobs, with health, with housing. Um, and with the inequality we're experiencing. And thank you, Claire. Paul, the final final word to you there. <clears throat> yes, that's, uh, I agree with everything Claire says. And uh, obviously, you know, people make up these, say these, that uh, well, you know, a lot of the people coming from Afghanistan and other places where young males and young males can come with all kinds of problems, whereas now these are women and children. So there's a, there, there all kinds of arguments have been made about the, about the differences. And the, 
what we need to do is to really examine what sits underneath that. What are our values, you know? And is there degrees of racism? Well, of course there are. <laughs> Let's not pretend. Of course there are, right? The question is not other, but what do we do to, to get around them? What do we do to suppress those views? Now, my view is that, the again, the media have really been peddling callousness. You know, when you've seen a lot of the people in Calais pushing against the barriers and that sort of thing, instead of seeing the desperation for these individuals, the, the media were really t teaching us to be callous, telling us we should be callous. We can't be callous. So we need to take responsibility for the fact that there are things in us which can make us turn away from people when we really shouldn't. And the compassionate position is to be honest about that, not to be kind of shimmy shammy around that, say, yes, okay, hold my hand up to that. We didn't do very well on that. So how can we do better? How can we do better? How can we see what happened with the Afghan people and the Syrian people? How can we got it so wrong there and we're trying to get it better here? And how can we actually learn from our mistakes? So rather than shaming, blaming, we've got to acknowledge that we didn't do very well. And for whatever reasons you want to come up with, but the key thing is how can we be better? How can we improve? Well, that's it. Thank, thank you so much, both of you, um, Paul and, and Claire. I, I found this absolutely fascinating and, and um, quite helpful to be honest. It's a scary time at the moment. And lots of people are feeling a bit, uh, a bit perplexed about where we go from here. And I think um, your responses um, there have, have been very, very helpful. And hopefully um, people who haven't been able to watch will be able to view back and, and, and uh, have a look at some of the, the points that you have, have raised. Thanks as well to Matt and Compassion. Uh, in politics for all that they do. And uh, thank you to everybody that's joined us this afternoon. Uh, have a lovely rest of your day. Bye now. <laughs>